of preaching through a book, it drives me to find the Lord's intention in every passage of Scripture. If we just preach topically, it tempts us preachers just to choose the things we like and we get on the hobby horse and just ride that hobby horse to death. And preaching through a book of the Bible, chapter by chapter, and verse by verse, forces me to deal with that passage of Scripture maybe that I haven't dealt with ever before in, uh, in preaching. And so it drives me to find out what's the Lord wanting you and me to know from this passage of Scripture. And commentators and preachers and teachers often neglect chapter 15 and chapter 16 in the book of Romans because they feel like they've handled most of the doctrinal part of the book and the dispensational part of the book and they have done a little bit of uh, practical part and so 15 and 16 oftentimes just gets brushed aside but I find that there's some great nuggets of truth in there that can help you and me and that's what we're looking for today and I need your help a little bit. Since we are down, you're going to have to amen every once in a while, maybe twice as much. Amen. So you're not that exciting. Well, maybe you can stir me up. <laughs> Chapter 15, verse number 22. Let's look at it in the book of Romans. We're almost finished with the book. We've got one more chapter to go. Romans 15 and verse number 22. For which cause also I have been much hindered from coming to you. He's speaking to the church at Rome. But now having no more place in these parts where he has been ministering and planting churches in Asia Minor. He said having no more place in these parts and having a great desire these many years to come unto you. Whensoever I take my journey into Spain I will come to you. For I trust to see you in my journey and to be brought on my way thitherward by you if first I be somewhat filled with your company. We're filling each other's company today. Amen. We're here together. This is our little church community together and we're filling each other's company. I benefit from being with you. and I hope you benefit from being with each other. Verse number 25. But now I go unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. For it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make, certain, make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. It hath pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in Carnal things. Now those carnal things doesn't mean sinful. It, it just simply means things of a temporal nature. Money. Possessions. And so he's saying these poor saints down in, in, in Jerusalem have fallen on hard times and you folks are making up an offering, a love offering to give to them to help relieve them. The carnal things, the, the money that they're giving. When therefore I have performed this and have sealed for them this fruit, I will come by you into Spain. And I am sure that when I come unto you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. For I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea. And in my service, which I have for Jerusalem, may be accepted of the saints, that I may come unto you with joy by the will of God and may, be, may with you be refreshed. That's an important word right there, refreshed. You ought to underline it in your Bible. We need refreshing, don't we? And Paul says, I'm, I'm coming to you, and I, I'm going to try to refresh you, and maybe in the process I'll get refreshed too, and we'll just refresh each other. Verse 33. 
Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Well, let's pray. Father, thank you for this passage of Scripture. And Lord, we pray you'd help us, although we cannot dig into the deepest depths here today, we pray that you'd help us to gain some help for our own lives, Lord, that might be beneficial, not only to us personally, but Lord, in our service to others and our service to you. We pray that you'd bless, fill us with your spirit, Lord, speak to us from heaven, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now, Paul had just finished several years of evangelistic meetings and church planting and He's been, uh, he's been soul winning all across Asia Minor. He's gone from town to town and, and he's, uh, he's had a bunch, of service, uh, a bunch of churches planted during that ministry. And boy, he's been busy. He's been going from place to place and he's going back and reporting back to the church at Antioch where he came from. And, uh, and he's been going across the land, planting churches and, uh, and doing what he could to introduce the gospel to those Gentiles in that area of the world where they had not heard and as he's winding up this letter to the church of Rome, he's, uh, he talks about the fact that he needs to go through Jerusalem and to deliver a love offering that the churches that he had planted in Asia Minor, he had received a love offering for all of them uh, to help out those poor saints in Jerusalem. And he's going to go through Jerusalem. He needs to go through there and, and, uh, and see them and drop off the offering and spend a little time with them. And then... Then he's been, he's been going hard, man. He's got to go through Jerusalem. And next he says, and I'm going to Spain. Well, Spain's on the other end of the known world at that time. I mean, this is the other end of the Mediterranean Sea, going west. And so he says, I'm coming to Jerusalem, and, and I've been ministering up in Asia Minor, and I'm, I want to come and see you, and then I'm going to Spain. And Man, he sounds like a busy man, doesn't he? And people involved in Christian work ought to be busy. He's going to open up a new mission field in Spain. And we might wonder how in the world is a guy like Paul, as busy as he is, I mean, he's been up there planting churches. He's been stoned and beaten and whipped and run out of town. He's been treated spitefully in many places. He, he's been in Jerusalem and that part of the world where the Jews are, and they've treated him awfully too. And, and so he's, he's, he's been busy trying to serve God. And boy, a lot of stress on him and a lot of busyness and a lot of fatigue and, and health problems. And, and how does a guy like that keep from getting worn out? Tiring. How can you do all that? And he sounds enthusiastic here. In the passage we just read, it sounds like he's excited about the fact that he's been doing all this and he plans on going on and doing more. He sounds like he's excited about it. He's joyful about it. And how can he do that? And how can you and I face our daily lives with the daily grind that may not be on the same level with Paul's ministry but how can we face life? Listen, how can we face life daily without getting dragged down, worn out, fatigued, and become dull and dry and discouraged? We're at the end of the year. Christmas is over. The presents have been opened. Trees will start coming down. My wife's planning on taking hers down right away, June. <laughs> We're worn out from the holidays. Somebody said the, the most beautiful Christmas lights of all is the tail lights of the family as they're going down the driveway after Christmas. <laughs> I don't feel that way about it. I'm glad to see all the family. But I'm telling you, it's, it is wearing on you after days of preparation. I mean, you've been fighting the crowds at Walmart, and, and you, you deserve a, a, a badge of honor for being able to withstand that and come out alive. But... Daily life, not just at Christmas, but daily life gets tough, doesn't it? I mean, we're all busy. I, I used to have some people say to me once in a while, man, I'd like to move off down there to Arkansas. Maybe they're talking about moving down from Chicago or New York. And like, Well, I'd like to move down to Arkansas and live that laid-back life. I'm like, son, you ain't seen nothing until you move down here. 
<laughs> you ain't, you ain't going to live a laid back life. You still got to make a living. You still got to serve the Lord. You still got to do stuff. You got to see after family. It's not as laid back as you think. We have many things that come at us and wear on us and stress us and beat us down. But how, here's the question, how can we face those things and not just endure it? Enough of this enduring business in life, but how can we face life tomorrow and be enthusiastic and joyful about it, looking forward to what the Lord has left in our life for us? How can we do that? Maybe we can learn a couple of lessons from Paul this morning in this passage of Scripture. Let's see if we can. How did Paul manage all of these things and keep pressing forward? That's what we're going to call the message today. Pressing forward. Pressing forward. Leaning slightly into it instead of stepping back from it. Stepping, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> stepping into life with a joyful spirit. I want you to notice in the first place that he made plans. Now the Holy Spirit changed some of those plans. As far as we know, he never made it to Spain. If he did, it's not recorded anywhere. But he planned to go to Spain. I mean, here's a guy who's been working and he's been serving the Lord and he said, man, I've worked up there and I've worked down here and I'm going over yonder to Spain. And by the way, I'm going to stop by and see you folks at Rome on the way. He was making plans. You know what will help your plans or help your life to have a little more joy in it? Listen, have some plans. Have some plans. Paul made plans. He declared his plans, and that is significant. He said, here's what I'm going to do. Do you know what you're going to do tomorrow, next week, next year? You say, well, it might not come to pass. It might turn out like Paul's plans. Evidently, the Holy Spirit turned him in another direction and he didn't make it to Spain. Well, Paul was a godly man and he was a spirit-filled man. I mean, anybody that reads the New Testament can see that. So he didn't make worldly, fleshly plans and go into Spain. This must have been plans that he at least felt like was within the will of God. But yet God changed it and he got off over there and got in trouble and Jerusalem and ended up in prison. Now, he got to Rome, but not the way he planned, but it, we don't know if he ever got to Spain. So what's the use of making plans if the Holy Spirit might step in and change them? Because you make the plans and let God do the changing. We're not supposed to just sit back and say, okay, I'm sitting here and I'm not going to do anything till the Holy Spirit leads me. You may not ever get anywhere. <laughs> And life may happen all around you, but not in you. Having plans is like seeing the breaking of dawn just as you're coming out of the dark night. You ever been out in the morning when, the, man, everything around you, maybe you go get in your car to go to work or you're going on a trip and you go out and get in your car, and, man, everything is black and dark and then the, in the eastern sky, finally, you see in all of that blackness, you see a little, bit of, a little bit of the evidence of dawn coming. That's kind of encouraging. And then sooner or later, the sun comes up. Having plans will make your life that way. It'll, it'll put the sun on your horizon. Making plans is like being stranded on a desert island and seeing a ship coming towards your island in the distance. Having plans is like being in a deep pit with no way out and discovering a ladder. Having plans will move you and motivate you forward. How do you stay motivated in life? Make plans. That's what Paul did. More people, or more than being afraid of people, Paul was afraid of, he was afraid, he was afraid of not being used of God. In 1 Corinthians 9, 27, it says this. Paul, Paul wanted to be used. He wanted to be busy, and so he was making plans. Now, if God came along and said, Now, Paul, I don't want you to go over this way. I want you to go over this way. Paul was always ready and willing to let the Holy Spirit change his plans, but that didn't mean that he didn't make plans. In 1 Corinthians 9, 27, he says, But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have Preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. He's not talking about losing his salvation. He's not talking about being 
condemned to hell. He's saying, I don't want to be a castaway. I'm saved and I've been serving, but I don't want to do something to disappoint the Lord and end up being set on a shelf like an unused appliance that you got at Christmas. Paul said, I want to be busy. I want to be used. I want to plan things. And if God changes it, it's okay. But I'm going to plan things in the meantime. And then if the Holy Spirit doesn't say, don't do that, but do this, then I'm going to go ahead with the plans. Hello? We ought to have plans. Paul did. Did he have any hindrances to his plans? Yeah. Look at verse number 22 in our text. He says, For which cause also I have been much hindered from coming to you. Much hindered. Hey, you'll make plans and you'll be hindered. You'll have things that pop up and change and you have no control over them. There'll be hindrances that come, but keep on making plans anyway. Keep on having a purpose in your life. Have a direction where you're going. He was encouraged by finishing his previous plans. In verse number 23, watch this. But now having no more place in these parts, there where he had, he had been ministering, he, he said, I, I have no more place here. I, I went here, I wanted to come where there were nobody, where there was no gospel preaching happening. I wanted to go there. He was an evangelist. He did not just decided to go somewhere and pastor and stay in one place, his calling was to be an apostle to the Gentiles. And he said, I went there to Asia Minor. I found this group of people over here. They needed to be saved. I led them to the Lord, planted a church, and I moved over here and did the same thing again. And he said, there were some hindrances along the way. But now that I've finished all those plans, I'm, I'm done with what I plan to do over there. Finishing plans is encouraging. Did you ever start something? And then when you finished it, boy, you went, <sighs> you just felt relieved and you felt satisfaction from, you planned it, you went about it, you worked at it, and you got it finished. Where I grew up in Izzard County, we used to drive by this place up the road about a half mile from where I grew up, and uh, there was a man who started a house there. He poured the foundation. And he put the two before studs up and had walls all around that foundation, just, just two before studs, no lumber on the walls. And it was just standing there like a skeleton. And I'd drive past that place. That, well, I'd go by with my dad driving when I was a little boy. And as I grew up, I, that old wall still standing there. It never got finished. It stood there until it fell over and rotted. Somebody planned to build a house, but it didn't get done. How discouraging that must have been. Do you set plans and don't finish them? Do you start a lot of things and leave it undone? There is a satisfaction that comes from starting something and then seeing it through. That's what Paul's saying. He said, I wanted to start some churches. I wanted to win some people to the Lord over here and over here and over here. And I've finished that. Now I'm coming to you folks at... Rome, I'm going through Jerusalem and drop off the offering. I'm coming to see you and then I'm headed to Spain. You know why he was so encouraged about what he was going to do? Because he could look back and see what he had done. When you finish some things, it's gratifying and encouraging to your life. He was encouraged by finishing previous plans. He had a godly desire to see those people at Rome. And because of that desire, he looked for a way to fulfill it. Romans 15, verse 23. But now having no more place in these parts and having great desire these many years to come unto you, whensoever I take my journey into, into Spain, I will come to you. For I trust to see you in my journey and to be brought on my way thitherward by you if first I be somewhat filled with your company. He said, I've been wanting to see you folks for years. I wanted to come and spend some, some time with you. I want to be refreshed with you. I want to see if I can help you and impart some spiritual gift. And I plan to come and I'm going to work it out one way or the other, he's saying. You know, it's good to have dreams, but we need to put feet on those dreams. If we don't devise a way to fulfill those dreams by the means of plans, 
It'll never happen. I mean, we wouldn't, if we hadn't put some planning into this, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have a building here today. If we hadn't put some planning into this, we wouldn't have some people here today. If we hadn't put some planning into this, we wouldn't be enjoying each other's fellowship. If we hadn't put some planning into this, there'd never have been anybody in that baptistry. If we hadn't put some planning into this, there never would have been a Liberty Baptist Church. And if you hadn't planned to be here, the place would be empty. So having dreams and, and a vision of what you want to see happen, that's great, but you've got to put feet on it. Devise a plan. How are you going to make it work? Paul had looked this over and he had decided how he's going to make it come to pass. I'm coming from Asia Minor, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going through Rome, and then I'm going to Spain. He had the plan made. Now, did he get there? I don't think so. But he had a plan and he was working his plan. Sometimes your plans change. And that's when some people just quit. When plans change, it doesn't work out. There's a story about the young and cocky cowboy that was out on the street there in the old western town and this old, old man with leading a mule come walking into town. And the young cocky cowboy pulled out his six gun and started shooting the dirt right in front of the old man. Bang, bang, bang. Start dancing, old man. Bang, bang, bang. <laughs> and he's shooting the ground and the old fella danced in the dirt. And then the fellow's pistol clicked and he stood there the old man stood by his mule and he said uh, to himself and to that young cowboy he said you've pulled the trigger six times and I heard it click I think you're out of bullets and he reached in his saddlebag and pulled out a 12 gauge shotgun and he pointed at the young man he said have you ever kissed a mule before and the young cowboy looked at him and he said no sir but I've Always wanted to. <laughs> Sometimes we don't end up doing things the way we had planned, but we don't quit. Paul was sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit, and his plans got changed, but he kept on going until the day he died. Joy comes when we have a map of what we want to accomplish, and we put plans to it, how we're going to accomplish that. Paul gives us another clue about pressing forward. We want to press forward in life, don't we? Who wants to just sit still? And uh, I, I've heard some preachers say, man, I don't, want to, uh, I don't want to burn out, so I'm going to rest and not do anything anymore. <laughs> and uh, I heard other preachers say, man, I'd rather rust out as to rot out, or rot out, or something like that. Butchered that one, didn't I? <laughs> so there's another clue about pressing forward, how to get forward in life and enjoy it. Paul, what did he do? He found purpose in planning to help those in need. See, his, his plans weren't just to satisfy himself. His plans brought joy to him, but it was through helping other people. Remember those churches he planted? Remember those souls he led to the Lord? Remember that he said, I'm going through Jerusalem and take some money to relieve those poor saints? He was interested in helping others. Verse 25 in our text. He said, but now I go unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. For it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make, certain, to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. He was thinking about helping those people out. There's some people down there that's, they're not eating. There's some people down there that's going to be in prison because they can't pay their debts. And so he told the people in the churches up there that he'd established in Asia Minor, we, we need to take up an offering and go go down there and help those people out. Now in doing that, he helped himself to stay encouraged. We need to always have a, a plan and a backup plan. 
having a backup plan is beneficial a lot of times. I was bush hogging. I had a fellow with bush hogging here at church one day, and, and a fellow come driving up into the parking lot, and he saw me out there, and, and he got out of his truck and stood by the truck just watching me bush hog. I figured, well, that fellow probably needs something or wants something. And so I turned off my bush hog and just drove the tractor up here to the parking lot. And he was standing there waiting on me. I, I said, yes, sir, can I help you? He said, are you the pastor? I said, I am. He said, uh, I see you're bush hogging the property out here. He said, it looks like you're doing a good job. He said, uh, I know you, you're probably not interested in this, but uh, I thought I'd ask you since I saw you bush hogging. He said, I've got, a little, I've got a little spot of land over across town, and the city's on to me about getting it mowed down. He said, I've let it get so big, it's so tall now. And he said, there's some small bushes in it and some briars and vines. He said, my mower is not going to mow it. And he said, they're going to find me if I don't get it bush hogged. And he said, I saw you with that bush hog. I thought you might be willing to do it for me. He said, I'll pay you good. I said, okay, well. Uh, I said, I, I don't need a lot. I, I said, how big is it? And he, he told me. And so I drove over there and looked at it. And, and uh, it didn't look like it'd take all day long. So I told him, I said, well, I'd, how, how would it be if I did it for $100? He said, okay, that would be good. And so <laughs> I went back and got my trailer and hooked up and drove over there and, <clears throat> and got out and started bush hogging that. And it wasn't, it wasn't too bad. It was going good. And I got over to the one edge of the property. And boy, all of a sudden I felt a pain in my arm. <laughs> and I looked down and there was a hornet there. And he's working me over. I'm talking about those old black hornets with the yellow stripe around their, around their abdomen. You know, he's, he's a mean dude. And about that time I looked and there's another one getting me over here. Man, I'm, I'm in a cloud of them. And I look down and they're coming out of the ground there. And they weren't those little yellow jackets, although they are painful, but these little big old hornets got a stinger that long, you know. And those guys are working me over and I'm hurting. Man, you talk about a preacher kicking a, a tractor into fourth gear, high range, and moving out. I was gone. <laughs> those hornets never knew where I went. But I had to finish the job. How am I going to do this? i got to drive over there where they're at. Can I drive fast enough to avoid them? Not in bush hog at the same time. I happen to think. I keep, I keep a few honeybees, and so I keep my bee suit in the back seat of my truck just in case I find a swarm of bees or need to look at one of my hives at another place. I've got my bee suit with me. Well, I went back to my truck and put on the bee suit and you never saw such a surprise bunch of hornets in all your life. They just had to stand there and watch me bush hog, and they couldn't sting me anymore. Hey, having a backup plan, having your bee suit ready, having a plan B if plan A falls through, having a desire to do something for the cause of Christ. That is what Paul is doing here. His plans were not just to fill up time. They had a purpose of helping people. You know why a lot of Christians are so miserable in their Christianity? Because I never do anything for anybody. They're looking out for number one. And it's when we get outside ourselves and we start looking around, see, what can I do for him? What can I do for her? What can I do for them? What do they need? When we begin to look around and find a plan to fulfill a purpose to help people, then we're going in the direction that Paul, that Paul did. Paul accepted the challenge of a genuine need. In verses 25 through 27, he's, he said, now I'm going to go to Jerusalem and minister unto the saints. Man, he said, now I know you folks need, need me over there. I've been meaning to come and help you at Rome, and I'm going to do that. And those people in Spain need me, and uh, they need the gospel. They need to know how to be saved. I've got to go over there. And so I'm, I'm going to put feet on these dreams, and I'm going. He's going to help people. And one of the things that can encourage us and motivate us to go on through today and tomorrow and next week and next month and next year is when we begin to look around and see how we can help people. Helping people. We've got to get outside ourselves. Paul did that. I mean, he certainly wasn't looking out for himself. There were people that needed help down there in Jerusalem but he said I, I had those people up in Macedonia and uh, in those churches up across 
Asia Minor, he said, I had them to take up a, an offering. See, those people up there in those churches he had established, he's teaching them something. He's teaching them to be givers. He's saying, you folks need to give. You need to be good stewards. And by doing that, you'll help yourself and you'll help those down there. There were people in Jerusalem that needed help, all right. They needed to be re relieved of their hardships and their deficiencies. But these people over here in those new churches Paul had established, he's saying you need to learn to give and they need to learn to receive. Jesus said in the book of Acts, it is more blessed to give than to receive. You see, encouragement comes to us and facing tomorrow is more exciting when we can find people to help. My wife, she lives to help other people. She's always looking for something. She can buy somebody or do something for somebody or help somebody. She spends her day. She never sits down. Unless she's sick like she was a couple of weeks ago, man, she got down. But if she's not sick, she's busy from daylight till bedtime trying to find somebody that needs her help. That's what she lives for. And you know what? She stays encouraged about life tomorrow. Living life gives her reason to live and the fact that she's got a handsome husband. Just check and see if you're still awake. So the people up in Asia Minor and those churches needed to learn to be good stewards and give and the people down here needed some help. So a symbiotic relationship, one helping the other and they help each other. I ran out of diesel one time. I was driving a little tanker truck up through Virginia headed to New York City. <laughs> And uh, going up I-81, Sean, you, you've probably been up through there in your truck, haven't you? I-81 up through Virginia, you truck over that way. Going up, uh, isn't that the one that goes up from uh, Bristol, Tennessee, up all the way through Virginia? Yeah, yeah, right. It's, uh, it's the main route going north. And so driving up through there, and I think it was just north of Bristol, and I was driving, a, it was a, a little tanker truck that I was going to deliver in New York City, but I had forgotten to fuel up at the last town I was in, and I noticed the fuel gauge is looking really low. How many of you like a challenge? I mean, you don't want to keep a full tank of gas. You want to run that baby down there where it's low enough, you've got a challenge, see if you can get to the next town, right? <laughs> a, a lot of us men live that way. I mean... It's no fun just driving around with a full tank of gas. You want that thing, that needle to be close to empty. And so it's close to empty. In fact, it's on empty. And there's not another town for a few miles up the road. Man, I'm trying to baby the accelerator to try to get all the fuel mileage I can out of that little truck. And finally up ahead I see the sign for a, for a station. And it's got diesel. And so, I mean, boy, looks like I'm going to make it. Thank you, Lord. And about the time I hit the exit ramp, boom, it quit. I'm out of diesel. And I've got to get to the bottom of the exit ramp, take a right, and that station's around that way. And when you know it, there's a stoplight down there. <laughs> and it's red. How am I going to take off? Well, I ended up stopping. And just got like 200 yards to get around that curve through the intersection around into the station where I can pump some diesel. I jump out, <laughs> throw the door open on the driver's side, and start pushing that truck, pushing on the door frame, pushing that truck. It's still rolling just, just a little bit downhill, and so I'm pushing it, and I'm gaining about three or four inches every time I push it. I got 100 yards to go. The guys over at that station could see me. There was several, about four or five guys over there, and they could see me struggling to push that truck. You know what they did? They all come running across the median, ran over there to my truck, and they gathered around that truck, and they all started pushing it. And we started gaining a foot every time we showed, now instead of two or three inches. And they pushed me all the way up to the pumps, and I was able to fuel up with diesel. Isn't it great when you have people that are willing to help? I mean, these guys could have stood over there. They could have stood over at the station and pointed and laughed and said, <laughs> look at that idiot. He's over there trying to push a truck by himself. But this gave them purpose. They were helping somebody in need. 
They probably got home that night and probably sat around the table and told their, wife, told their wives and kids how they helped up some nut from Arkansas push a diesel truck into a fuel stop. They had purpose. And when those people at Jerusalem were poor and needy, these people up here in Macedonia and Asia Minor just said, we're going to help them out. Isn't it great when you're in need and you've got people to help you out? Paul was busy trying to find people to help out. That was his life. And in verse 27, we see that they discharged their debtorship. Paul said, you people up there in Asia Minor, you were Gentiles. You were, you were away from God. You didn't have the scriptures. You didn't have the gospel. You didn't have any hope of eternal life. And the Jews down here, they had the Bible. They had the word. And the church sprang up in Jerusalem and began to spread northward. And because of the Jews down there in Jerusalem, the word of God through me, Paul, got up here into Asia Minor and you Jews got saved. Now you don't have to go to hell. You owe them a debt down there. And they repaid their debt by giving offerings to those people. Well, let me hasten on. Paul arranged a, a map of efficiency. He, uh, in verse 28, he said, When therefore I have performed this, there in Jerusalem with the poor saints. When I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, the offering, I will come by you, Rome, as I head on to Spain. See, he planned out a map. He's saying, I'm coming from up here, down here to Jerusalem, then I'm going to Rome, and then I'm going to Spain. It sounded like he had it detailed out, didn't he? When you make plans, do you, do you detail them or do you just think it'll all work out? <laughs> It takes putting some details in the plans. A lot of us have things we wish would come to pass, but we don't put the details of how to get there step by step. Paul's saying, here's how I'm going to do it. A disorganized life. Are you listening to me? A disorganized life will be discouraging to you because it's going to fall flat so many times if you don't have detailed plans to get you from point A to point B. <clears throat> I went outside one day. <laughs> I was going to take something out to the shed and store it away. And I got out on the porch and I saw something laying there that needed to be picked up, some trash, and so I went to put it in the trash can. Got it put in the trash can and I saw something else that needed to be done over here, a tool rake or shovel or something that needed to be put away. And so I took it and put it away. And I'm zigzagging all through the yard pretty soon. My wife said, I thought you were going to put that thing away that you started to the shed with. I said, well, I got sidetracked. <laughs> you ever get sidetracked? See, I didn't have all those other things planned. And it threw me off track of getting the main thing done that I intended to do. If we don't put details to our plans, step-by-step -step plans, hey, New Year's coming up. Got any plans? You going to just stay on autopilot? Or are you going to make some plans? Paul made plans. Let me give you the last one. He prompted his heart toward refreshing relationships. How did Paul press forward? He wants to lean into life instead of stepping back from life. He's pressing forward. And how did he do it? He did it by looking forward to the encouragement that he could get from relationships. No man is an island. We don't live to ourselves. Paul in verse 29 and 30, he continued a heavenly connection. It says there that he's talking about the Lord Jesus and how, how God's plans for him and God's will all fits together. See, many times we forget to include God in our plans. And that's when we really get messed up and really get discouraged because God's got a way he wants us to go in life. And when we stay on track and keep him included instead of pushing God off to the side, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. See, when we include God and put God first, God first, then our plans mean something. And what we accomplish will be what God wanted us to do instead of coming up empty. 
He wanted to keep community and communion going on with the Lord, his heavenly connection. And then verses 31 and 30 through 33, he wanted to be refreshed with a human community. Let me just read to verse number 32. He's talking to the people at Rome in verse 32, and he said, that I may come unto you with joy by the will of God and may, be, may with you be refreshed. I like that word refreshed. I just love it. When I think about being refreshed, I, I can see one of those old shows, old movies uh, from years ago where this guy's crawling across the desert. Maybe he's in the Sahara, and he's, his tongue's hanging out. He's dry. He's thirsty. His lips are parched. He has no water in his canteen, and he comes over a sand dune, and right down there in the bottom is palm trees and a cool spring, a little paradise. Does that sound refreshing? I bet it was to that guy who was crawling across the desert. And life can become like a desert. And it become dry and dull and boring and meaningless because we haven't had community and refreshment from God's people. Now you people that are watching online, I am so glad you're watching. And some of you had to watch online today because it was the only way you could make it work. Ah, oh, but some of you need to get off the sofa because you can be here. Now, if your health keeps you from coming, I understand. I'm glad, we've got the, I'm glad we've got the capability to come to your living room by the way of Internet, and we'll always be glad to have you watching. We treasure you. But if you're able to get out of that chair and drive or have somebody to drive you, you need to be in community with the people. You see, when Paul went to help people, he wasn't thinking of himself. Some people don't come to church because they think, well, I can watch online and that's all I need. All I need. What about your brothers and sisters and what they need? Hey, I guarantee you when people look around in the church house and they see other folks worshiping the Lord, they see other people serving the Lord, they hear other people giving some amens and they hear the singing and can look into the eyes of the people who are singing and preaching and teaching. When we're together in a live community, you're helping others, not just yourself. You see, Paul got rid of the selfish desire to just be his own man and not need anybody else. He needed refreshment with the people of God. Thank God for the internet, cameras, YouTube, Facebook, and all the things that bring us into the homes of people. But if you're able to get into the church house, that's where you belong because you help your brothers and sisters. Isn't that true, folks? And you that are here today know that. I, I'm saying this for the benefit of those who might just be thinking, well, they're getting everything they need. They're hearing the same thing you are by sitting in their living room. But it's not the same. It's like that... <laughs> That one preacher that said to a guy, said, I, I, can see, I can see everything I need to see and hear everything I need to hear just by watching church on the Internet. And he knew the guy's daughter played softball. He said, well, won't you have your daughter to play softball by Internet? He said, well, she needs to be there in person to play softball. He said, that's my point. <laughs> to play softball and to be in community with your brothers and sisters, we need to be there. You see, because it's not just about me or you. It's about the community of others. We need each other. Well, I had enough points to bore you for another 30 minutes, but I think I'm going to quit right here. And what I want to say is plan your life. Don't try to set it on autopilot and just... Siri's trying to butt in. Never mind. Don't just set your life on autopilot and have just knee-jerk reactions to what happens around you. Put some plans in motion. Write it down so you can remember it. What do I want to do this coming year? 
I mean besides lose weight. <laughs> besides diets. <laughs> besides exercise. I know how that exercise goes. It lasts about three weeks if you're lucky. <laughs> I'm talking about making some plans that will put you closer to God and closer to your fellow man. What are your plans? Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you'd bless us today. Help us, Lord, to take to heart the lessons you've shown us from the life of Paul in this chapter. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us not to just be dreamers, but doers. Help us to put feet on our dreams. Lord, help us to have plans and then plan that work and work that plan. I heard that you either fail to plan or you plan to fail. Lord, I pray you'd help us plan to fulfill your will. Lord, if there's, not, if there's people who are not saved listening at this time, I pray that today they'd understand that they're a sinner, like the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Lord, I pray they'd understand that Jesus died on the cross to pay their sin debt in full. Lord, I pray that they'd realize that you're just a touch away and you can give them that salvation because of what Jesus did. If they'll simply put their trust and faith in the Lord Jesus and what he did on the cross, I pray they'd do that today. They'd accept Christ as Savior. I pray for the Christians, Lord, that may have just been living life helter-skelter disorganized and dissatisfied. I pray that they'd begin to build some plans and then work those plans. Lord, to serve you and to help others. I pray you'd bless us today during this invitation time. In Jesus' name, amen.